So today I welcome you. I wish you well in your talks and endeavours today. Please take it on board, listen to it, take notes, take it out, sell it from our community, our elders, both past and present, the Lapras, Bichuka people, I myself. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks, Sunny Barbara. So at the end of this training workshop, we might have an increased understanding of the impact of culture, and particularly the impact of culture when we're talking about this brain disease processes called dementia. We'll know more about what dementia is, um, how to communicate more effectively with someone with dementia, how it may feel to have dementia, how to support Aboriginal friends and family who are affected by dementia, and resources which are available to assist you and your community to know more about dementia in Aboriginal communities. My name is Sharon Wall. I was born in Sydney, Australia. My cultural background is fourth generation Australian from Anglo-Celtic background. The languages I speak include English and a mitzy bit of schoolgirl Italian. Three things that influence who I am today are my grandparents, my parents, my children and my family, my sometimes hard-fought values and beliefs, and a variety of mentors that have guided me in my life. So that's what I consider to be my three most important groups of influences. This is a, a poem that um, I recently acknowledged um, and it was gifted to me in a way to use um, in, a, in a report that I wrote. And again, I think it's a very powerful message about the influence of country and culture. I am a child of the Dreamtime people, part of this land like the gnarled gum tree. I am the river softly singing, chanting our songs on my way to the sea. My spirit is the dust devils, mirages that dance on the plain. I'm the snow, the wind and the falling rain. I'm part of the rocks and the red desert earth, red as the blood that flows in my veins. I am eagle, crow and snake that glides through the rainforest that clings to the mountainside. I awakened here when the earth was new. There was emu, wombat, kangaroo. No other man of a different hue. I am this land and this land is me. I am Australia. And again, acknowledging the, the incredible influence of country on Aboriginal culture and the deep rootedness of what that means. This is a table which is putting together some sociological perspectives of the difference between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal culture. And again, I think it's really important for us to consider this in a, in a very open way and acknowledge from the outset that there are particular differences um, and similarities. So what this table says, for example, that in Aboriginal culture, identity is influenced by family and social factors. In non-Aboriginal culture, identity is measured by occupation and socioeconomic status. In Aboriginal culture, society is group focused. In non-Aboriginal society, society is individually focused. In Aboriginal community, family is strong and extended. In non-Aboriginal community, despite the fact that many of us acknowledge the influences of our family, non-Aboriginal um, families are generally seen to be somewhat weak and nuclear. In Aboriginal um, communities, children are part of an extended family and they learn to make decisions early. Um, in non-Aboriginal um, communities, children remain responsibility of parents and boy, don't I know that. In Aboriginal communities, strong relationships to ancestral land and the spiritual strength that comes from that. In non-Aboriginal communities, travelling widely is valued and indeed moving off land and living and living from and, and leaving birthplace and living in other um, places and other land is common. In Aboriginal community, inner privacy is strong. Only particular people may know things of a personal nature. In non-Aboriginal communities, directness and forthrightness in conversation is valued. In Aboriginal communities, material possessions are not highly prized. In non-Aboriginal communities, material possessions are highly prized. In Aboriginal communities, you may, people may be known by a number of names and relationships. In non-Aboriginal communities, we are generally known by one name. In Aboriginal communities, provisions, in terms of provisions, it's take only what you need for today. And in non-Aboriginal communities, um, it's about accumulating for tomorrow, which is why, as non-Aboriginal um, members of the community, we continue to pillage our land. 
I guess the, you know, the other thing that we need to acknowledge is the concept of health and well-being through the prism of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And this is a quotation from a colleague, um, Dr Tamara McCain, who says, to us health is about so much more than simply not being sick. It's about getting a balance between physical, mental, emotional, cultural and spiritual health. Health and healing are interwoven, which means that one can't be separated from the other. So again, an understanding, trying to understand the, the pervasiveness of, of health and what health means um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And I guess that's very reflected in um, this particular um, quotation, which will be familiar to very many of you. But this is when we first undertook the Koori Dementia Care Project, we engaged an artist by the name of Mary, pa Mary Jane Page to paint for us, uh, to imagine, and then to provide a painting for us that, that talked of dementia in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. She gave us this, which has really been, um, a, a, if you like, a foundation for us in understanding and working with communities with dementia. Mary Jane's interpretation was that in the middle part of the brain is a black spot, which is the first sign of dementia, and it spreads like a vortex through the other brain cells. The rest of the black around the brain is the other cells dying, and the silver represents the minimum of brain tissue that is left. The red shapes represent the blood flow, the blood cells, and the veins. There are slight greens in there, which to me is always to do with mentality that acts like a calming. Also in the centre of the brain is the eye of the mind. We are all born with the eye of the mind and we will die with the eye of the mind. It's just part of our existence. The eye will always be there, even in sickness. The track in the top right and lower left hand corners symbolise the memory leaving the brain. The black in the background is the death of the brain tissues. Everything's gone and that's where it goes to when it dies. It symbolises loneliness and how the person feels with dementia. We don't know where it goes to and that is what we're hoping to find out. The flowers represent hope, hoping one day there will be a cure for dementia. The red in the flowers is strength and power because we must have the strength and the power to have hope. The gold also means strength and it signifies the sun, hoping that the sunlight comes in and that there will be a brighter day for those people suffering from dementia. So again, a very holistic understanding of dementia through a totally different prism to the way that I saw dementia when I came in to work on this project. And that was really, really important. This is not the dementia I've known for the last 30, 40 years. It's not my understanding. This is an understanding through the eyes of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community through this painting. So it's formed a, a very important foundation for us in holistically understanding this. So let's start then by talking about what is dementia. So I just want you to sort of just personally reflect on, you know, what's your experience of dementia and understand that different people in this, in this particular group and in a, in a broader and wider audience will have different experiences um, with people with dementia or living with people with dementia. So what is dementia? Dementia is actually a term used to describe a brain-related syndrome. So I think one of the most powerful and important things that people always need to be able to take away about dementia is that it is brain-related because immediately there are a lot of, you know, a lot of um, mythologies around dementia and there are a lot of misinterpretations around dementia and, you know, historically um, people have been blamed for their behaviours or that they, you know, may be doing things for particular reasons. The bottom line is this is a brain disease and it is something that people don't have control over. Okay, it is brain related and it's characterised by some impairment of memory. So you would be familiar with the fact that in most instances that's short term memory loss. Okay, and often <clears throat> people will present with short term memory issues but may indeed maintain and retain a long term memory for you know a reasonable period of time. Long term, short term memory are different parts of the brain. So we can lose one and maintain the other, okay? Um, so it's short term memory loss that we're normally experiencing. Um, people have some impairment of their emotional control and or motivation. So something's happening in their, 
in their um, emotional control or their motivation or lack of motivation to do things. They have some impairment of their judgment, their planning, their organising. So they're the sort of things that start to impact on their day-to-day -day activities. Okay? Um, they're not judging appropriately, they're not planning appropriately, they're not organising, then they're not able to carry out their normal activities of daily living without people making observations of something being amiss. Okay? So this is the, the sort of stuff that people start to get a bit concerned about. And all of that, and also an impact on their social behaviours. This is what draws people um, to the fact that something's wrong. Okay? Now, ordinarily, and in most circumstances, it's people outside looking in who will make the observation that something's wrong. We talk about dementia, though, being the umbrella term. Okay? So dementia is the big picture. Okay? Then there's different types of dementia, and you'll be aware that there's you know, a lot of terminology in this area, okay? um, and people will get somewhat confused about that. At the end of the day, it's a bit academic, okay? but because really the issue is assessment, diagnosis, and good care, okay? irrespective of what type of dementia it is, or if it's dementia, Alzheimer's, or if someone says someone has Alzheimer's but they've got another form of dementia, et cetera, et cetera. It's a bit academic, but dementia is the big picture. okay? So we talk about it as an umbrella term. Then there's a number of different types of dementia. And the most familiar one that you will know is Alzheimer's disease. But we also have dementias such as vascular dementia, small stroke dementia, multi-infarct dementia, maybe called any of those things. So this is someone who may have had a history of having small strokes. So not necessarily a significant stroke that you know, we might be more familiar with someone who has the symptoms of a profound stroke, but rather someone who's been having little strokes, throwing off a little bit of material all the time, which builds up, okay, and we end up with significant problems and the things that we talked about before. We then have a Parkinson's disease dementia, so again, um, people with a, a, um, a cognitive decline related to their Parkinson's disease, so all the symptoms, all the um, presentation symptoms of Parkinson's disease, you know, shuffling gait, um, you know, mobility issues, etc., with this cognitive decline, which is a Parkinson's disease dementia. And we talk about the frontotemporal dementias, which is sort of, you know, quite a big bag of dementias that impact on the fronto and temporal lobes significantly. And we talk about dementia with Lewy body, um, again, a, de a more discrete sort of um, dementia in that. Um, Lewy body disease um, impacts quite significantly on behaviours. So, and uh, people often have quite florid behaviours, delusions, etc., um, particularly, and can often have, you know, behavioural and management problems because of that. As this slide says, the mixed dementia um, is part of a mixed dementia in about 75% of cases. And again. We've got those understandings, um, which we didn't have necessarily a decade ago or two decades ago, because of a very generous sort of brain donation program that's taken place over time, so that we're able to go back retrospectively and look at people's brains and their presentations um, and understand dementia a lot more. So what does our brain look like? It's, it's pink, it's hydrated, it's moist. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's what we would consider to be a healthy brain, OK? As opposed, opposed to this brain here with um, Alzheimer's disease, it, it looks dehydrated. It appears to have been shrinking down as those sulci become wider. Um, and it is indeed shrinking down in terms of capacity. <laughs> and probably best sort of seen even in a slice of a brain um, and seeing the significant difference here between a normal brain and an advanced Alzheimer's disease brain in terms of the size of the ventricles which are essentially fluid filled. The brain is an incredibly complex organ um, and you know when we're talking about a deteriorating brain we have deteriorating function. And so what happens in good assessment in terms of um, Alzheimer's disease and indeed the other dementias is that we can have an understanding through people's behaviours where their diseases, your, their disease presentation may be or indeed the other way around. If we, if we know where 
their brain is particularly diseased, we know through the anatomy of the brain where their behaviours may manifest. So importantly, I guess the, the brain holds our story and it tells the body what to do and it's the control centre and there's billions of cells and synapses and lobes which have specific fun functions. And as I said, importantly, I think, we, we, we have to acknowledge from the outset that if any part of the brain is damaged or sick, it may not be able to carry out its work anymore. And that's a very, very important message to get across to all communities. So Alzheimer's disease specifically, it makes up about 70% of the dementias in all populations study. It attacks specific brain areas and has specific protein pathology that accumulates over 40 plus years before onset. The usual onset is with loss of memory, then visuospatial skills, language and organisational skills. And personality and social skills are often retained until late in the course. It's slowly progressive and irreversible. We do have treatments. We have what we call treatments for Alzheimer's disease, um, which most people, I think, would suggest are a variable success and uh, with different impacts on different people, but they are treatments, not cures, okay? Um, so that's the important message there. So what are the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease in non-Indigenous populations as we know it? The biggest risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease is age. If you don't want to develop Alzheimer's disease, don't age. That's, that's, that's a simple and sad statistic, okay? So that is by far the biggest risk factor. Head injury, um, and particularly the history has been, in terms of the research, a significant blood, blunt head injury. Although that is becoming a bit broader now in interpretation, I think, in terms of a risk factor. We know that in many cases it is also about genetics and we talk about risk genes and deterministic genes. Um, I think a very important thing that keeps coming up as a risk factor and something that is impacting specifically on the development of programs um, in prevention and, and in, in many instances treatment is unhealthy vessels, okay? So working on the assumption that if you've got a healthy heart, you've got a healthy brain, okay? So we're knowing a lot more about vessels and vessel health and the impact that has on our vital and major organs. And what some of you may not know is that um, Down syndrome is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So we know that in almost 100% of um, people with Down syndrome develop Alzheimer's disease by the, age of, by the age of 40, although many may not develop symptoms till much later, if at all, okay? But we know that the pathology takes place in the brain. So that exponential increase in terms of age it's while the risk of dementia increases with age, dementia is not a normal part of ageing. So again, that's a very important thing that we'd, we've had to work with quite strongly in, in um, mainstream education in terms of dementia. We don't, we don't want people thinking that every older person is going to get dementia. And indeed, it influences and has influenced, I think, a lot of ageism in our community. Um, and so it's something that we fight very hard to make sure people know that this is not normal ageing, okay? It will never be normal ageing, it's abnormal ageing. But the average rate of moderate to severe dementia amongst Australians is about 1 in 15, age 65 plus. Among people aged 80 to 84, the rate is 1 in 9. And among those aged 85 plus, it's 1 in 4. Okay, so how do we assess Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's disease we talk about as a disease of exclusion. So we make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease on the basis of excluding anything else it might be. So what that means is we don't have a quintessential sort of test for Alzheimer's disease. We have to take away any other possibility before we come up with that diagnosis. So that includes um, you know, it, it, um, excluding things like depression, delirium, normal ageing, etc. And then that might involve extensive sort of physical screening, which might incorporate neurological and psychiatric assessments, a whole range of possible things. Um, and assessment is additionally dependent on the history of the function and decline. So we need to talk to family and friends. We need to know what's been happening. And as I said, people with Alzheimer's disease are not their best historians, okay, um, by nature of the disease. So we need to talk to people about what's been happening. 
We may use the, you know, things like various sorts of imagery to support the diagnosis, various sorts of neuropsychological testing, and we may assess people's activities of daily living, particularly in their own living and functioning environments. So again, that has a particular pertinence in terms of cultural differences, okay? Um, but it's particularly valuable to see how people are functioning in their normal environment. So, getting on to what we know. Um, so that was sort of some mainstream dementia stuff. But what do we know about ageing and dementia in the Aboriginal population? And what indeed, you know, have we gathered together in evidence to assist us to, you know, create and develop resources and understanding in the community? Well, the question is, are Aboriginal people ageing? The proportion of Aboriginal population aged 60 plus is 4%, non-Indigenous is 14%. The number of older Indigenous people aged 55 plus will more than double between 2006 and 2021. It is a young population overall, but indeed Indigenous population is ageing. Okay? And that's something that's very well um, articulated in the research. And at older ages, life expectancy is actually becoming closer to non those of non-Indigenous populations. Okay? But of course, and this is a quotation from Tony, a downside of living longer. Is there a downside? Yes, there is. It's a double jeopardy. Um, it actually ends up being a double jeopardy, and you might even want to think about it as a triple, quadruple jeopardy in terms of the Aboriginal population. Is that a downside of living longer is that with population ageing, Aboriginal people may be, and that was his quotation, we now know that is an R, okay, so it's, it's determined at, they are at higher risk than non-Indigenous people of comparable age of dementia due to neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, this has been um, something which is, you know, particularly concerning. Many of you will know the, the first understandings of dementia in Indigenous Australians occurred through um, a study in the Kimberley. They identified the prevalence of dementia at 12.4%, which was 5.2 times greater than the overall Australian population rate of 2.4%. Most importantly, what they also determined in that population was that the dementia types. So, um, and essentially looked very similar to non-Aboriginal, non non-Indigenous um, population in terms of types. So Alzheimer's type being most prominent, um, vascular, um, alcohol and other medical conditions, etc. Additional understandings from that study in the Kimberley were that Indigenous males seem to be more greatly affected by dementia than Indigenous females in that population. And remembering that the population in the um, Kimberley is a very remote um, population, okay? Um, so a very different population to what we might be seeing and what we, we know that we see in urban Aboriginal communities. Indigenous people get dementia at an earlier age than other Australians. So again, that was an observation from that Kimberley study. And Indigenous Australians are 21 times more likely to suffer a head injury with serious implications for cognitive and behavioural changes. Again, coming out of that Kimberley study specifically. <laughs>